Yeah, thank you all of you who have come for this week of studies and practice of meditation in the monastic tradition. I'm very happy that you have come here and I welcome you all, although a little bit late because this morning starting at 9 o'clock I had my monthly meeting with my council and people are coming also from outside Italy for that. And therefore I couldn't postpone it. <clears throat> but I'm very happy and I'm welcoming you here, especially Father Lawrence, uh, uh, Lawrence Freeman and Father Bernard uh, Savicki, the organizers of this meeting here, of this week. As I said, we are happy to host you here in the central place of the Benedictines. It, uh, some, uh, the Benedictines, as you know, perhaps are not centralized. But we are not an order, we are more a disorder. And uh, nevertheless, we need some kind of network. We need a meeting point. And it was Pope Leo XIII who, by the end of the 19th century, said the Benedictines have to have also something here in Rome and he bought the plot and paid quite a lot of the building here. And we have now exactly what he wanted, a faculty or it means a, a university with three faculties, philosophy, theology and liturgy. Philosophy has a specialization in philosophy of religion. Liter um, Theology has also the specialization in monastic theology, in history of theology, and in sacramental theology. And <clears throat> then uh, the, there is the liturgical institute, which is the only real um, liturgical faculty around the whole world. And so many professors for the future are trained here. And we have 500 students coming from about 90 nations, male and female, religious and <clears throat> lay people, all kind of students, as you may have seen already a little bit around, but most of the students are on holidays now. We finish by the end of June here in Rome, generally, not only we, but because the summer months are too hot for studies. At least this was established when there was no air condition in the rooms. And we are still working on that to have air condition all over the house. But we won't freeze it down as the Americans do to 18 degrees centigrade. Yeah. <clears throat> Anyhow, so, and in the house are living 120 people, uh, students, professors, and also officials. Uh, Two-thirds are monks, and then there are priests and stu uh, other students here. So, it, and they are coming from 40 nations. When Pope Francis came here, and he asked me, how many people are living here? I said, 120. Bah, he said, how do you feed them? And I said, of course, we have a large refectory. No, no, I mean, so financially. I told him, yes, uh, they have to pay a little bit. And for the rest, the abbot primate is going out for begging. <clears throat> Fundraising is one also of the major jobs of an abbot primate because the Benedictine order doesn't have the money, sufficient money to develop Sant Anselmo or do the whole maintenance work. Now let me come back to your uh, being here. I think after many years of experience in different forms of meditation and contemplation. It's important to review these experiences and look towards the future. It's not just looking backward what are the 
traditional method, but what's our method? And I think each one has to find his contemplative way. After Vatican II, the tradition of meditation and contemplation has been taken up much more than before. Interest was shown even by many people outside the church, especially also by people, by faithful people of the church who found that Christian life had been determined in the end too much by dogmatic and legal restraints, that there was no longer a real life. The heart had moved into the intellect, faith to theology, medita meditation into ritualism. And they said, but this is not faith. Our relationship, our eternal relationship with God. And it was the time in 1966 when Karl Rahner, the great Jesuit theologian, said, the pious of the future will be a mystic, one who has a little out or he will be no more. He insisted very much on this mystical part also of our Christian existence. <clears throat> the contemplative tradition was taken up by spiritual masters and there was quite a number. I don't know if, I'm not aware if young spiritual masters are growing at this time. I don't know because most of the books are written by people who have already a long experience. But these spiritual masters were looking outside also of the Christian tradition in order to enrich the own Christian tradition and opening it up also to wider groups <coughs> outside Christianity. Like we know uh, these people, B. Griffith, Thomas Merton and so on, you have it also during this week you hear quite something about them. And it, there was a time after Vatican II when uh, people gave the impression that contemplation and meditation is done only in the Orient, no longer in the Western spirituality, no longer in Western monasteries. And I had an interesting experience. In 1979, the first group of Japanese Buddhist monks came to my monastery. We had about 10 of them. And from that on, our continuous spiritual exchange started, also in other European monasteries. And it was interesting. They said in the end of two weeks of staying in our monastery, but that's strange. The Europeans are coming to our country saying that there is no spirituality in the Western parts of religion, but in the reality, we found quite a lot of deep spirituality in the monasteries. It was very interesting to me especially also when I wrote a book, I don't know if it's who was the author. He was a Dutch journalist. He wrote a very bad book about the Japanese monastic tradition. He went there full of hope to find spirituality. And then he saw the real way of monastic life of the monks there. And he was completely disappointed. Therefore, he has given it uh, the book, the title, The Broken Mirror. But it's, it's way back now. <clears throat> and I was shocked because I said, even if you criticize, I know them also. 
and I know reality. It's our reality also in our Western monasteries. We are not just saints. We try to do our level best to follow Jesus Christ, but we are normal human beings with all our different characters. And therefore, St. Benedict says also in the um, 72nd chapter of his rule that the monks should bear each other's, uh, I don't know the exactly the English version, bear each other's failures of, uh, of body and of character. So there are always, we are and remain sinners. But nevertheless, we have to find our way to contemplation and meditation. And through this way, to find our way to God. The then Cardinal Ratzinger, <clears throat> or out of his office, came a document on meditation where a fear is shown that the center of salvation would disappear in modern meditation. When I read it, I thought, but you have, not, you have no real experience of contemplation and meditation, what it means. Perhaps he or the other authors had not experienced the need of unity of body and soul and to prepare also our body to open up our soul towards God, the eternal light. This is not simply by sitting down and reflecting upon sacred texts or mysteries. That's not sufficient. We need more. We have to prepare our whole existence, to open up our whole existence towards God. <clears throat> Therefore, what they proposed was more an intellectual reflection on the mysteries of Christ. Of course, they were theologians by profession. And I think we have a different experience, perhaps a deeper experience trying in our daily life to struggle through our existence, not only by work and prayer, but also by meditation. After Vatican II, another thin, real thin stream has developed in our monasteries into a larger stream. Thank God, the Lectio Divina, the Ruminatio of sacred texts, like the mantras, to repeat those sacred texts continuously. And <clears throat> I think it's uh, by repetition, it, became, it may become superficial, but it can also become like a screwdriver going more and more inside the body and our soul. And I'm very, very happy, I very often said, Perhaps Lectio Divina is at the root of a reform of our monastic life. The soul opens up to the Word of God. This goes beyond any kind of reflection or exegetic, exegetic studies. It changes the whole human existence in order to become a new creature to become a new creation, as St. Paul would put it. It is God himself, his spirit, who uh, by this is working in us and transforming us. It's not our method, it's not our doing, it's not our creative reflection, but it's opening up that God can work inside of us and transform us. The basic attitude of a Christian should be uh, uh, the listener of the word, as Karl Rahner also put it, Hörer des Wortes. 
to listen to the word of God because this can bring us real salvation. And this corresponds to the first words of the rule of Saint Benedict. Listen, my son, to the words of your master and to listen with, your, uh, with the ear of your heart and not only with your outside ears as you are reading, for example, a newspaper, but to get a deeper understanding. Therefore, you will not find a special method of meditation in St. Benedict, perhaps the repetition of sacred texts, but for St. Benedict, it's God himself who forms you. The daily routine of a monastic life in a community is the training camp of a monastic in order to be transformed. It's the whole monastic life which would be the method of meditation. It should bring you into in front of God. And transformation is the gift of the divine grace. Nevertheless, throughout the whole monastic tradition, we find ways of opening up our hearts in a special way in order to be able to listen more carefully to the word of God. I think also of Johannes Cassian and all these people. We have a long series of spiritual masters in the whole tradition. And to lead us to a closer union with God. This week, <clears throat> You will receive a lot of input, I hope so, but not only an input, but also the chance to practice the different ways in order to find your own way. I have seen that, for example, there are a number of articles and books on Lectio Divina, how to do it, oh, it becomes very complicated. This is not my way. I cannot memorize all the different steps. But when I get up, for example, from my short siesta, I take the New Testament and take some of the texts, sit down, and my inner eyes open up to God and my ears are opening up also to God. And I let myself be touched by the word of God, that my heart is really touched by it, and it has become my daily nourishment. And I need that even if I'm outside the monastery, which happens very often, unfortunately. But you need a spiritual Food. But it's not <coughs> in order to be very strong, but to get the food of God himself. After the practice of many years, the attitude of listening can bring you to a basic contemplative attitude of living in front of God in continuation, respectively, to stay with God, to stay together with God, and to experience the joy of being loved by God. <clears throat> I think it's also important when I see some of the spiritual books, I'm asking, where are the words of love and of joy? Sometimes it looks as a very stern and austere practice. Open up, relax. God loves you. And it's a joy of being loved by God. Japanese Buddhist monks asked me several times why Christian monastics are so full of joy. I said, I don't know if that's true. But it was interesting that they made this remark. 
And I reflected a bit and I said, perhaps because we, are, we know and we are aware that we are loved by someone. By someone who embraces us or as in Psalm 139 he said, he embraces us and puts his hand on his, our head. It's wonderful to experience that. <clears throat> Sometimes we monastics give the impression as if contemplation and meditation would be only our privilege. This is simply not true. Each Christian, and especially the active ones, need an inmost contemplative layer unless work becomes just an activity of busy bodies. And that's important that your activity is coming, flowing out of the depth of your heart so that it's not a superficial one. We have simply to watch Jesus Christ. His strength was his contemplation, his prayer at night, very often on the mountain, where he withdrew into solitude. And I think this can be also our strength. His preaching and his work has been a manifestation or even a revelation of his unity with God's will, with his heavenly Father. The kingdom of God is supposed to permeate all human beings. <clears throat> I think, my dear sisters and brothers, this week can become an important beacon in your life. It's kind of symposium. You know, the ancient Greeks, or the Greeks in the ancient period, they very often found together in the evening for a symposium. They sat together and symposium means to drink together. They drank some wine and the wine opened up not only the hearts but only the mouths. <laughs> also the mouths. So, <clears throat> you have come here together to drink not material wine but a spiritual nectar. And I think that's important, that we are drinking this wine until perhaps we are drunk of God. And comes up to my mind Psalm 42, which starts, A deer longs for the flowing streams. So as a deer longs for a flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and behold the face of God? Dear sisters and brothers, I do hope that you will have the chance to grow and drink much of the living water during this week. God bless you.